This is chapter 11, Navigating the Employment Relationship. So in this chapter, we will be looking at some um, aspects uh, we have already uh, seen, but look at some more details such as um, amending an agreement um, and some other issues. And we will also look at uh, new things related to the life of the employment agreement or things that may happen uh, during the employment relationship. So as um, learning objectives, we have uh, first one to explain uh, the effective use of an employer's policy manual. We'll also uh, look at the definition of a handbook. And another objective is to outline the legal requirements for amending an employment contract. We've seen this already, but uh, it is time to stress this in detail a little bit more. Uh, and then we'll also look at identifying ongoing uh, management issues. And we'll end at explaining uh, employers' vicarious liability for damages caused by employees. Well, I've explained this to you uh, twice already, but um, the chapter also uh, touches upon this uh, once again. So the employment contract. Well, first thing we should know is that the employment contract is the law between the parties. So the main law of an employment relationship between an employer and an employee is the employment contract. So everything that is prescribed in the employment becomes law for both parties. Uh, we have already discussed that um, prescriptions in the employment agreement, they have to meet the minimum uh, employment standards uh, as per the Employment Standards Act but uh, in most cases uh, prescriptions they will uh, be over uh, employers will offer more uh, than the uh, minimum standards in the Employment Standards Act so that is the main law um, we also have some implied terms, as we uh, saw already, implied, implied terms that will come from uh, common law, that will also come from the Employment Standards Act. So, for example, um, if there's no a wage uh, determined in an employment contract, for example, in a verbal employment contract, it is implied that the employee uh, gets paid at least the minimum wage so that is that is an example of implied terms um, also employees they have to perform their duties with reasonable skill and good diligence uh, those are also implied terms they are not expressed in the employment agreement uh, but they they apply to an employment relationship the uh, contract terms they mostly bring uh, express terms so everything that is clearly written black and white uh, in the employment contract and remember that a contract to be uh, valid uh, requires an offer uh, acceptance of that offer and also consideration remember consideration being the price to be paid or the mutual benefits remember in an employment agreement, consideration will be uh, the employee will get the wages or salary and benefits, uh, safe workplace, etc. Whereas the employer will get the employee's time, uh, service, skills, experience, etc. So that's the price each party is paying. So that's uh, consideration. And when an employment contract needs to be changed, um, another offer 
consideration and acceptance are required for that change to be valid. Um, so if your boss promises, only promises you a raise, but does not get anything in return from you, more hours, more duties, uh, that is just a promise. It's a free promise or a gratuitous promise. Uh, hopefully, uh, your boss sticks to their promise and give you the raise. But if your boss doesn't give you the raise, you cannot enforce because that is a gratuitous promise. Again, that was a uh, promise without a valid consideration. So you did not give anything in return. Okay, so those requirements for a valid contract, they also apply for any changes, any amendment to an employment uh, agreement. Uh, handbooks and policy manuals. So handbook, a handbook is usually a quick reference uh, booklet for uh, the employees where the employer is providing information on uh, usually related to the when, where, and how uh, of working for the employer. So when um, when employees can uh, request for a day off, for example, uh, where employees can have their uh, lunch break if they are in the employer's uh, premises, or even cough break, uh, how employees should um, uh, save their passwords or how employees should be uh, should use uh, internet etc so it's a general uh, instruction manual to say so so um, employees would have a quick reference to this information whereas a policy manual is usually more detailed a policy manual is usually more detailed because it aims at explaining why things are to be done in a particular way. So why um, the employer has the right to monitor employees for um, while the employees use the employer's equipment. So through the policy manual, the employer would forewarn the employee that they may be monitored and why they may be monitored. Um, why employees have to present a certain type, a certain model uh, of a doctor's note if they um, called in sick or something uh, related to an illness or injury. So a policy manual is much more detailed than an employee handbook. But both the handbook and the policy manual, they should always be given to the employee. And we have discussed this already, but it's important to emphasize, they have to be given to the employee at the same time uh, of the employment contract draft. So the employee has to sign the agreement after reviewing any employee handbook or policy manual so that they uh, are binding on the employee. Uh, still with regards to policy manuals, so they um, may effectively communicate uh, what the employer's expectations uh, are. Uh, for example, uh, with regards to benefit entitlements, so when uh, benefits uh, start, entitlement for benefits starts uh, usually after probation, usually after a three-month period. Uh, if there are any sick leaves or any other forms of leave, again, detailing how they are to be taken, what documentation is required, procedure, well, where to file, um, and how to, to file or to request, uh, disciplinary procedures, so what actions, uh, what wrongdoings w uh, would trigger uh, disciplinary procedures, uh, harassment policy and procedures, again, uh, prohibition of uh, harassment in the workplace, but also how employees can uh, complain 
make a request uh, for correction, uh, etc. Probationary periods um, usually uh, more likely in the employment agreement itself, and uh, not in the policy manual. But in the policy manual, uh, you could have uh, details on uh, assessments during the probationary periods, uh, etc. Uh, termination notices the same, uh, most likely to be in the employment agreement itself, not in a policy manual, but a more detailed explanation um, of the termination notice, uh, resignation notice, uh, could be in, in a policy manual. And other examples would be uh, rules regarding to dress codes, and ex expense accounts, uh, how to claim for reimbursements, etc. So those are uh, some of the topics that are usually covered in policy manuals. But there would be, you could have a, a specific uh, anti-bullying and harassment uh, policy manual, uh, one for uh, safety workplace policy manual. Uh, so it depends on how detailed the company uh, want to be uh, with regards to a specific topic or a specific point. Uh, there are other functions of policy manual that that are to uh, communicate changes. And those changes, they could be minor or could be major. Uh, it is important to differentiate uh, one uh, from the other, so the minor from the major, because the procedure the employer has uh, to follow uh, is different. So when you want to communicate a minor change uh, through a policy manual, so you have updated your policy manual, and there's a slight uh, road change there. For example, um, you are notifying the employees that the cof coffee break times uh, have changed. So that's a minor change. You are not taking out any right. Employees are still entitled to a coffee break. You're just uh, changing the time. So that you could just uh, give a new copy, a uh, copy of the amended uh, policy manual to the employees. Uh, and that should suffice. That should be okay. However, if there are major changes, if you are... Uh, changing in entitlements for something, changing a right, uh, you may need to provide or to take additional steps and to provide more notice period to the employees. So let's say uh, the company decides to change uh, the uh, benefits uh, provider and while changing the benefits uh, provider for, let's say, uh, extra healthcare uh, expenses, uh, instead of a 1,000 uh, account, uh, yearly account, employees will now have only a $500 uh, account uh, yearly. So you're actually changing the amount of the benefit. So employees will have to be uh, told in advance that their right is being changed and you would give them one month, two months, three months, depending on the change, could be even one year advance a notice of the change. And you should also inform uh, the employee that uh, it is okay for them to uh, not accept that change, but then uh, the consequences if you um, decide to dismiss an employee uh, because they do not accept that change, that is fine as long as you uh, give them a proper notice. So, uh, again, if through a policy manual you aim at making major changes to the employee's rights or benefits, then um, additional advance and notice, longer period of notice has to be given and you also have to detail what the consequences are in case the employee decides uh, not to accept that change okay uh, so that is uh, an important aspect here 
<clears throat> so how how can employers uh, maximize the benefits of a policy manual? So employers should incorporate a manual by reference into the employment contract, provide a copy to the employee prior to their signing the contract. So really, really important here to emphasize this. Ensure the manual language is clearly drafted. The employer has also to apply the policies consistently among employees. Ensure employees have an up-to-date copy. Give as much notice of significant change, changes as possible. So what we have just discussed, minor change, very short notice is fine, but a major change. So the major um, the change is the longer the advance notice period uh, should be. Uh, have employees sign an acknowledgement of receipt of the policy manual of the updated amended uh, policy manual. Uh, ensure employees understand any breach of uh, the policy manuals and their consequences. So what the consequences uh, would be for such a breach. And employers should also create a clause uh, that gives the employer sole discretion to change the policy. So uh, this policy is uh, <clears throat> um, is in effect uh, in any given time, uh, and the employer has the right to change or amend this policy manual uh, at their own discretion. So you would uh, draft a clause um, similar to this. And employers should be updating their uh, policy manuals periodically uh, in a way to reflect all the changes that take place uh, from time to time. So those are uh, important good practices for policy manuals during the employment relationship. So changing the employment contract, as we've discussed several times during the course, um, a change in the contract um, has to be uh, made via um, an offer, an acceptance, and consideration. So uh, there's an exception here. If it is a minor change, here the example is claiming for a reimbursement. So let's say you're just changing the procedure, but you are not taking any right of reimbursement out of the employees so you can just announce that change and distribute the amendment copy draft and employees would sign uh, that is fine uh, so it's but it's a minor change and this change is not affecting any of the employees rights uh, at that moment however if a, if there's a change of a fundamental nature as we call or a major change a change related to uh, a right of the employee examples here could be reduction in pay or demotion uh, which is reducing to a lower rank uh, in the company so in this case or if you are taking out uh, rights so as I said let's say uh, the employee was offered uh, three uh, week paid vacation and now the company is changing their policies and they will only provide the employees with two week paid vacation. So in this case, this is a major change because the employer is actually taking rights uh, from the employees. In this case, you should provide longer notice and this notice should be similar or equivalent to a common law notice. This common law notice comes from this case, Bardal versus Globe and Mail. Uh, we will discuss this in more details in chapter uh, 14, if I'm not mistaken, but very briefly here. Uh, this notice, this common law notice, take is, takes into consideration the age of the employee, the length of service the employee has provided to the company, availability of other jobs, uh, 
related jobs. Uh, if there's any bad uh, intent, bad action from the employer, which here wouldn't be the case. So the common law notice is much longer. The common law notice period is much longer than the um, notice period prescribed in the Employment Standards Act, which is one week, and then it goes up one week every year of uh, service. So again, the more you want to change uh, the, the rights of an employee, fundamental rights, uh, the more notice you have to give. You have also to uh, provide consideration. So you have to pay something, you have to offer something. And the employee has to offer something uh, back. So offering the employee uh, the uh, keeping of their employ, uh, employment is not a uh, valid consideration okay so you tell the employee well if you accept the change from a three-week paid uh, vacation to a now uh, two-week paid vacation uh, you get to keep your job but if you don't you will be uh, dismissed so keeping the job is not a valid consideration you have to offer something more you have to offer let's say one day off more pay something of, of uh, uh, monetary uh, consideration, something uh, that has actually a value to uh, the employee. And the employee would also be offering uh, the acceptance of having uh, fewer rights or their rights uh, brought to a, a lower level. Uh, again, you also have to explain the consequences of uh, rejecting that offer. And it is okay for an employee to reject the offer. Uh, however, they should be aware of what the consequences will be if they will be dismissed. Uh, and if they are to be dismissed, they will have to be given uh, the legal notice, etc. And you should also give the employee time to review the change and seek uh, legal advice. So usually you would add uh, that legal clause uh, in which the employee warrants and declares that uh, they had time to seek independent uh, legal advice for that change. So those are the requirements for a major change. An offer, an acceptance and valid consideration. And time, time is key here. So the more uh, the change will be, the longer the period, the notice period has to be as well. Okay, so that is uh, very important here. Uh, constructive dismissal, reasonable notice. So constructive dismissal is a specific concept for uh, employment law and i told you uh, sometime in the past during this course that uh, you only go to court for employment related issues for wrongful dismissal and for constructive dismissal all other issues so if you're not being paid properly if you're not being paid over time, if you're not being offered a safe workplace, if any other rights of the employees um, is being violated, the employee should file a complaint with the Employment Standards Board branch. However, for compensation that would arise out of a wrongful dismissal, which we'll see in chapter 14, or in cases of constructive dismissal, then the employee would not file a complaint, but sue the employer, sue the employer in a civil court. Okay? And what is constructive dismissal? Well, constructive dismissal is when the employer unilaterally 
on their site makes a substantial change to the essential elements of the contract. So simple example here, I was hired to be a faculty member to deliver classes, uh, deliver lectures, uh, marking, uh, prepare lectures, but not to make any research. And then my boss comes to me and say, um, and says, uh, hey, João, from Monday on, you will be only uh, publishing research. You're not teaching anymore. So there's a change, a substantial change to my contract. And I was, I was not uh, made any offer. I was not consulted on. I was just given the change and I would have to accept. So this is a constructive dismissal. Okay. And to avoid constructive dismissal. So why are we dealing with constructive dismissal now? Because we are talking about the employment, uh, the employment contract being changed. So it is the employer um, wanting to change the employment agreement. So in this case, the employer should avoid to unilaterally uh, change the employment contract in a substantial way without giving advance notice, without explaining uh, what rejecting the change uh, would uh, be, what consequences for rejecting the change uh, would be. Okay, so that's why we talk about constructive dismissal. So to avoid constructive dismissal, my boss would come to me and would say, hey, Joao, we uh, need, we want, uh, well, let's say, we need to change your employment agreement. Uh, we don't want you to deliver lectures anymore. You will be only on research. So we are giving here a three-month notice or six-month notice. Uh, if you don't accept, well, you will be dismissed because there's no more. Uh, spots for you to teach, deliver lectures here. Uh, so that's up to you. Here's the amendment. You have time to think about it, seek independent legal advice, uh, etc. So this would be a way to avoid constructive dismissal to take place. But if there's a sudden change, the employee was not offered uh, to accept, then constructive dismissal may take place. Okay? So uh, whenever there's a change or an offer to change, so the employer would come with an offer to change, the employee may accept that change or also may uh, make a counter offer. Uh, the employee may tell the employer that this could be uh, a constructive dismissal, so they should have a longer period, or um, even if they are given. Um, a longer um, notice, advance notice period, uh, they could still regard this as a constructive dismissal. Uh, but keep in mind, the final word will come from the courts uh, if they decide to sue. Uh, the employee can also quit the job and they could sue the employer uh, for constructive dismissal because uh, they would find that that was a unilateral change. Uh, a unilateral substantial change so they didn't want to accept they quit and they would sue for a uh, reasonable notice uh, and the employer the employee sorry they could also sue the employer uh, keep on working but at the same time sue the employer for constructive dismissal well this uh, last uh, option is the least uh, probable because uh, I don't. I, I just can't see uh, an employee suing the employer, but still uh, working for that same employer. So again, the idea for the employer is to avoid um, constructive dismissal by the way they offer the changes to the employment agreement to their employees. And we have case law on constructive dismissal. 
uh, this comes from uh, Potter versus New, uh, New Brunswick. New Brunswick. Uh, so there's a test here. Uh, the court would ask if the employer breached an express, express or implied term of the employment contract. Uh, and if the answer is yes, the second question would be, did the employee consent? And if the employee did not consent, would a reasonable person see that breach uh, as a substantially altering an essential term of the contract? So that's the test for a constructive dismissal. There's also a second question. So if the answer for the first question has the employer breached an express or implied term of the employment contract? Even if the answer is no, okay, there was no breach. There's still a second question. That is, would the employer's conduct, general conduct, lead a reasonable person to believe they were no longer bound by the contract? In other words, was the employer attempting to force the person out, uh, for example, by humiliation or by any other uh, methods? So in any of the circumstances, either by making the work environment for the employee intolerable or by actually substantially altering an essential term and this term could be an express term or implied term of the employment contract so those are situations in which if there's no uh, advance notice period and a long one as per common law notice if there's no explanation of the consequences of rejecting the offer, then constructive dismissal would take place. So key here is very uh, related to, again, giving a longer notice as possible and also explaining the consequences of rejecting uh, that offer. Okay, so in those two forms, single unilateral act or a series of acts uh, would lead to constructive dismissal. The employee could then uh, quit and sue the employer or eventually stay and sue the employer. Uh, the employee could also accept that change because they would not want to uh, sue the employer. Uh, they, they could be uh, they could believe uh, the court would not regard such a change as uh, constructive dismissal, then they they would prefer to uh, accept that change. So those are the uh, possible scenarios. So looking at promotion, so when you want to change the contract in a way to promote an employee. So first thing you should keep in mind as an employer is that an employee should not be forced to accept a promotion. You either accept it to be promoted or you will be fired. This is coercion. This is illegal. And let's say if the employee accepts, but then the employee is unable to perform uh, the new duties, the new job satisfactorily. So the employer has to return the employee to their pre-promotion position or dismiss the employer can dismiss the employee, but has to provide a reasonable notice or paying leave. Okay? So... Uh, you cannot just dismiss for just cause uh, in a way that the employee uh, underperformed. Uh, and we'll see uh, progressive disciplining a bit, but we'll also see uh, just cause uh, in chapter 13 
if I'm not mistaken, um, in more details. So now just keep in mind that whenever an employee is promoted, if they underperform, you can only dismiss them if you provide reasonable notice or paying lieu of notice, or you have to return them to their uh, pre-promotion uh, position. So now, monitoring the contract. So throughout the employment relationship, it is important to monitor the contract. Two important aspects here that come to mind are uh, probation periods. So you may want to be assessing the employee during the probation period so that if you need to dismiss the employee during the probation period, the employee is aware that they were not performing well as per the assessment. You also want to monitor the contracts, uh, mainly the fixed term ones, uh, in a way that the fixed term contract do not become an indeterminate uh, contract. So you hire an employee for one year time, fixed term contract. So when this one year uh, ends, the employee should let go, should return all the company's uh, equipment, belongings, etc. So that's why uh, it is also important to monitor, uh, to diarize, to have a bring forward system if the company is medium to large, so that you are forewarned about those uh, key dates and important dates. Uh, performance appraisals. So performance appraisals, they are not a form of discipline. They are actually an opportunity for the company to provide feedback. And if done well, uh, employer may provide genuine feedback to the employees. And good practice here are to be honest and balanced, to communicate what the job standards are in a clear way to the employee, to give the employee a chance to respond. Uh, they may disagree. They may bring uh, forward their uh, side of the story. Uh, employers should be documenting the appraisal and giving the employee a copy. Uh, remember, for uh, risk uh, perspective, the more documents you have in mind, that you keep the more records you have, the better off you will be in case of a complaint, in case of a lawsuit. Uh, during the performance appraisal, the employer could also be setting the future goals with the employee and the employer should keep performance reviews uh, files separate from uh, salary reviews so one uh, is not uh, related to the other salary reviews uh, could be related to um, yearly review or could be adding more job duties uh, to the employee, but um, it is important to separate two things, not to create an expectation for the employee that whenever they are being, uh, their performance is being appraised, they should be expecting a salary review. So if this is not the, the objective or the aim of the company, they should actually be keeping uh, these uh, separated. Now, progressive disciplining. So what is progressive disciplining? It is disciplining the employee in a progressive way, step by step. So you cannot dismiss the employee right away because the employee did something that was not right. Employers are required to uh, follow a progressive disciplining process. Because discipline must be proportionate to the misconduct. If the misconduct is very, very serious, let's think about a uh, sexual assault, uh, sexual harassment, then it is fine. If you have records, if you have proof for this, you could dismiss for cause right away because the conduct is very serious. Uh, but if it's not that serious, the employer is required to follow a progressive disciplining process. And if the employer fails to respond to the employee's misconduct, 
within a reasonable uh, time period, this could be regarded as condonation. So the employer may be condoning uh, the employee's misconduct. And hence, in the future, they will not be able to uh, apply any of the uh, disciplining consequences. So, to avoid condonation and also to uh, meet the requirements of the law for progressive disciplining, the employer should um, follow a series of increasing steps after the misconduct. So in the first event, for example, the employer could give a verbal warning. And I say for example because the first occurrence you could give a written warning if you prefer, because you prefer to have records, written records. It is fine. But you have to understand the logic here, the rationale. So I'm exemplifying in a way that in the first occurrence of the misconduct, the employer would give a verbal warning. Second occurrence, a written warning. And then third or more occurrences, the employer could uh, suspend the employee for various lengths. Uh, but here, the employer has to be cautious because if they suspend, and if the suspension is unpaid, it is important that this is described in the employment agreement. This is described in a policy manual. Because if the employee is nev was never aware that they could be suspended, and during the suspension they would be unpaid, this could be regarded as a constructive dismissal. So you got to be cautious here. If you want to have the possibility to suspend uh, with unpay, um, unpaid or uh, not paying the, the employee, make sure you prescribe this in the employment agreement or policy manual. And then final written warning. The final written warning is very important because it is in that final warning that the employee will be made aware that their job is at jeopardy. So if they ever uh, commit that misconduct again, they will be dismissed for just cause. So this is um, the final written notice has to read like this, something like this. The next time you uh, commit the same misconduct, you will be fired, you will be dismissed for just cause. Then, if it, it does happen, you may uh, dismiss the employee for just cause, and uh, you shouldn't uh, be so much worried for a wrongful uh, dismissal lawsuit. Uh, step by step here, so employers should outline what the acceptable standards and consequences are uh, for uh, various types of uh, misconduct. They uh, should also explain what the progressive discipline process is, what steps will be taken, so will there be a first verbal warning or will the first warning be a written one, how many warnings will there be until that final uh, warning before uh, dismissal for just cause. Employers should also retain the right to skip steps when just fired. So the more serious the misconduct becomes, uh, the more uh, the employer should uh, retain this right. Employers should also clarify that this is disciplining and progressive disciplining, not performance feedback not performance appraisal that is different that is only about performing the job duties here is about uh, the wrongdoings the misconduct of the employee uh, in the workplace employers should also document each step again 
for legal risk perspective to protect themselves. Employers should also explain the problem and steps required to remedy that misconduct. Ensure steps are realistic with timelines. So if the employee has come in uh, under the influence of drug or alcohol, remember duty to accommodate, longer period here for the employee to recover, etc. Uh, the employer should ask the employee's comments. Uh, eventually, the employee may have a reason, they may have been uh, undergoing a serious situation in their family, something, uh, depression, uh, any other mental health issues. So it is important to uh, hear uh, what the employee has to say. Employers should set a follow-up date uh, for that misconduct be uh, remediated. Employers, uh, employers should train managers and then uh, the final warning, uh, warning stage is a state that the next step will be dismissal. Uh, again, in that final warning, the employee will read that the next time they uh, act that way, uh, they will be dismissed for just cause. So that's uh, what a valid progressive disciplining uh, or discipline process should be. Suspension without pay. So suspension without pay has to be a term of the contract. If it's not a term, either express or implied term of the employment contract, it may be regarded as constructive dismissal, as I said before. And if it is an implied term in a way that the employer has always applied this to all employees in the company, so the employer will have the um, burden of proof, the onus uh, to show that um, suspension without pay has been an implied term in all the company's employment contracts uh, through again, through way of customs or past use or presumed intention of the parties. The best practice here would be to have it as an express term in employment contract or in any of the applicable uh, policy manuals in the company. Uh, remember that if you have it uh, as an express term, remember you have to be uh, reasonable uh, so, because an employee arrived late, uh, and it's the fourth time uh, in a month, so you will not suspend for three weeks. So, you would suspend for two, three days. So, remember, you have to be proportionate to the misconduct, okay? Uh, if you are unreasonable uh, in suspending the employee, this could also be considered constructive dismissal. That is important. Uh, corrective probation. So when the, the employee's performance is being observed because they are being they are underperforming. Uh, again, that has to be uh, clear in a policy manual or employment contract. Uh, and how do you make it clear? Well, you explain what the consequences are if uh, performance appraisals uh, are not as satisfactory as um, it is expected to be. So good practice, make it as a contractual provision, you would include progressive disciplining process, and also you would, you would also provide a reasonable opportunity for the employee to improve. Uh, it may look similar, but it's not. And it's not the same either uh, with uh, progressive discipline. So, corrective probation uh, is a more structured uh, process. In a way, performance uh, is being assessed, and performance is uh, not good, is not well. So, you would put the employee under 
a corrective probation. But you could follow a similar, not the same, but similar steps as a progressive and discipline. So giving a chance, giving warnings, but giving a chance, providing resources, opportunities. Uh, at the end of the day, employers do not want a uh, big turnover in the company. So they rather uh, provide as uh, many opportunities as possible, as it is reasonable, uh, reasonably possible. Uh, to the employee or for the employee to improve. Uh, temporary layoff. Well, it may also be considered constructive dismissal unless, unless it is uh, a term of the employment agreement. So to be valid, a temporary layoff has to be either a, uh, an employment uh, term or it has to be a practice, a standard practice in that industry. Only in those two situations, a temporary layoff uh, would be okay. And if any of those uh, two situations are met, then the layoff is allowed. However, it cannot exceed 13 weeks in a 20-week period. So the employee is told to go home, business is going is, is not good let's say even because of covid or because of any other things so go home and i'll call you back you are temporarily uh, laid off so if i don't call back in the next 13 weeks if i never call back it means the employee was wrongfully dismissed because the employee was not given a reasonable notice. The employee was, in principle, in principle sent home uh, temporarily, but the thir 13 weeks exceeded, and the employee was never called back again. So this is a wrongful dismissal. So make sure if you don't need the employee anymore, uh, after 13 weeks, make sure you call them and you pay them in lieu of notice or you have them back at least for the notice um, so that you do not incur into uh, wrongful dismissal uh, expenses or lawsuits. Okay, so uh, again, employers, they have to ensure the contract allows for layoffs or it is a standard practice in the industry. And if it is not, or if 13 weeks, uh, if it exceeds, or it's going to exceed 13 weeks in a 20 week period, then make sure you provide notice uh, before dismissal. Employees are entitled to uh, minimum notice. Uh, attendance management. So just some words here. Uh, employees may be absent. Uh, for two main reasons. One is because they are um, at fault, uh, to say so. So we call this blameworthy absenteeism. Um, they are they were late because, or they were absent because they were actually absent. They decided to do something else, or they did something the night before. They decided not to wake up and go to work. So that is also known as the culpable absenteeism. And this one is, uh, is, uh, could be part of a progressive disciplining because there's no good reason to justify. But there's also what is called an innocent absenteeism, one in which can usually be justified, such as for legitimate medical or other causes. So this one cannot be disciplined. However, the employee has to follow the company's uh, procedures. And those procedures will usually be in a policy manual. And what are those procedures? So those procedures related to an attendance management. Uh, good practice here would be the company would determine who the person or number is uh, to call if the employee uh, is aware they uh, will be late or absent. Uh, the employee should be 
informed that they have to give as much notification as possible and they should also inform what their anticipated date of return will be the company in the policy manual should also be explaining when the doctor's note is required and if there's any specific form of the doctor's note the company wants to have uh, the company would also provide uh, information about a contact program uh, to refer or to be in contact to uh, call whenever those uh, issues uh, take place and also uh, providing a procedure for returning employees so let's say if it was related to a uh, medical reason so the employee can only return if they bring a, a doctor's note that uh, allows them to return to work so their issue was uh, healed they were not sick or they were they are not injured anymore and they are physically fit or even mentally fit to return to work so those would be the main requirements for a good practice or a good attendance uh, management program uh, in the company so the last uh, topic will be vicarious liability we already saw this so this is when the employer is also liable for the wrongful conduct of the employee and this is this takes place uh, when the employees uh, cause harm to others cause loss to the property of others uh, during the course of employment or during the scope in the scope of their employment so if the employees are performing their duties duties that were authorized by the employer duties that are in their employment agreement duties that they were actually hired to so if they cause any harm or loss or injury to others both the employee and the employer will be liable uh, for that loss but it could also be uh, duties that were not primarily authorized by the employer but they are connected uh, with the authorized uh, duties so let's say um, as a faculty member i have uh, bcat's uh, laptop with me i am i am not authorized uh, to illegally download uh, content but i am constantly downloading uh, legal content uh, for my classes for my students so even if i accidentally or intentionally download something illegally then bcat would also be vicarious liable because that would be connected with my teaching practice Okay, so those are examples uh, in which the employer would be also liable uh, for the harm, loss, or damage uh, caused by the employee. Uh, keep in mind here that uh, I say when we talk about vicarious liability, I am saying that both the employee and the employer are liable. However, the victim, they will only recover their loss from one of them. So in, in real life, uh, what really happens is that uh, the victim will sue both the employee and the employer. And if they win the case, when they are enforcing their award, their judgment uh, credit, they will collect from whoever pays first. Usually it is the employer because the employer has, in most cases, liability insurance. So in most cases, um, the employer is the one paying out uh, the award. Okay, but again, both may be sued 
However, only one will pay. Or if both pay, they will pay only the total amount. It's not that both will pay double the amount. No, it's either one uh, or the other. Or they split as uh, much as possible. Last thing here is liability, uh, employer's liability, but related to alcohol. So alcohol consumption, there are some startups, uh, usually not only, but usually some IT startups, they offer uh, in the company's fridge, there's beer free of charge for employees. There's wine everywhere um, and any other, uh, several other types of alcoholic drinks. So when the employer offers, serves alcohol uh, for free, for the employees, they have a similar responsibility as a commercial establishment, uh, like a bar, like a pub, has. So, uh, again, let me repeat: if you offer for free, not only on a daily basis, but in in a uh, event at the company. You, as an employer, you have a similar liability as a commercial establishment, as a pub, as a bar. And that liability is if the employee leaves the company um, under the influence of alcohol, uh, so impaired, drives in an impaired way, causes an accident, causes losses, damages, injuries to others, the employer is vicariously liable here. Uh, what is the good practice? How can employers avoid this liability? So the employer should limit the intake by providing a small number of tickets only. So let's say it is a Christmas party. Uh, so last year was a virtual one, but let's hope this year will be an in-person one. So the employer would give only one, two, three tickets to each employee. And if the employee wants to drink more, they would do this under their own expense. This would uh, help the employer to avoid their liability. Yet, employers should hire professional servers and tell them to refuse to serve to employees that are already intoxicated, that have drunk too much. Employers should also be serving food, not just alcohol. It helps uh, for the alcohol not to hit so badly. Employers should also provide free transportation from office parties, insist guests to use it so they could provide um, Uber, uh, Lyft, um, uh, coupons, or even some. Uh, free money or uh, reimburse whatever uh, expense the employee has with that transportation back home. Uh, companies should also provide designated drivers. Uh, keep contact numbers for family members uh, on hand in case the employee is resisting to uh, give their car keys because they are intoxicated, etc and appoint people to monitor alcohol consumption and make sure those uh, appointed uh, people uh, were not drinking uh, themselves in the party. So those are guidelines to avoid uh, being vicariously liable uh, while serving alcohol, not only in events, but also when it is freely uh, available in the company. So this was chapter 11, Navigating the Employment Relationship. Thank you and bye for now.